Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, I'm going to do another repair with you guys. This is a Fluke PM6685R. This is a universal frequency counter. Now, what makes this a special unit is that this particular one has a rubidium atomic clock built right into it. This makes it very attractive because it means that it has a very stable, very precise internal reference, making this not just a frequency counter, but also a calibrator. And it means that you can calibrate other frequency counters or other synthesizers to this reference that's built into it, making it a very nice unit for repair, definitely worthwhile. Now it has channel A, it doesn't have a channel B option, but I can feel the indent behind it where this could have potentially been populated with channel B. Now I'm not sure if there's a version of this with two channels, but indeed it has channel C, which goes from uh, 0.15 to 4.5 gigahertz, meaning that you can then, of course, compare frequencies as high as 4.5 gigahertz to the internal uh, rubidium standard. Now I have done a repair on a Fluke universal counter before, and in fact, it's right up there. And this particular one, Fluke PM6680B, was a two-channel one. It doesn't have option C installed on that, but I've done two repair videos on this, where on the second one, I believe, I retrofitted it with an oven-controlled crystal oscillator, which one of you guys sent in as a little module board, which was fantastic, making this a much more usable unit because the internal crystal was just absolutely horrible. So that means that if we can fix this one, we're going to have a very nice frequency counter here on our hand, be able to calibrate everything around the lab, in fact, and other synthesizers. Now, I do actually have a, a separate rubidium standard, which I came across very recently also, so we could even compare these two <laughs> against each other, the rubidiums against each other, if we can fix it. So what is going on with it? I'm going to turn it on and show you. Uh, when I do turn it on, and even when I just plug it in, because it does have a standby power, if you remember, uh, it makes this a horrible screeching noise, making me seem like that uh, uh, maybe power supply is bad. Now I know you guys don't necessarily like power supply repairs, but you know I don't choose what is broken in an instrument, and it varies widely, as you've seen with all the repair videos that I do. And again, I want to thank my Patreon supporters. They are the reason why I, ha I can do so much repair videos, and this is a very important because I know these are your favorite episodes, and I definitely enjoy doing them as well. And I don't charge every episode to Patreon. Uh, only episodes that are more than 30, 40 minutes I actually charge to Patreon. So if you go and look at that, you'll see that uh, only a fraction of my videos show up. So as, as so that I don't charge my Patreon supporters you know, too often, maybe once or twice a month at most. But uh, anyway, so this is going to be an interesting one, most likely uh, probably a short one, but we'll see how it goes. should be uh, cool to take it apart. So thank you again, Patreon supporters. You're making this all possible. All right, let's give it a try. I also have an assistant here making sure everything is going well. And he seems to be uh, quite happy about it. That's a good pooch. All right, here we go. So let's take a look and see what happens when I uh, just enable the power directly from my uh, variable isolation transformer here. So let's go ahead and turn it on. And there it is. And this is just in standby. Now, initially, of course, it's going to have to turn on the rubidium standard so that it can be warm and ready to go. So it is definitely what it's attempting to do. But burning 46 watts seems like a lot. And uh, if I go ahead and take a look at the unit itself, you can see, if I can ever achieve focus here, you can see that the unlock light of the rubidium is on because it's not warmed up yet. That's not a necessarily a problem, but we can go ahead and try and turning it on and see what happens. There it is. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but it sounds really, really bad, and then it's going just nuts. And um, I know that there are some threshold adjust you can do on this and, and it might stop that but it's obviously false triggering quite a lot and uh, I left it on for a while I'm gonna leave it on for a while a little bit longer I'm just a little bit worried about the noise the power supply makes it shouldn't be doing that and uh, I couldn't get this unlock light to go off so maybe the voltage is unstable and it just can't hit the point where it needs to and it sounds absolutely terrible so let's go ahead and open it take a look inside of it take a look at the power supply see if we see any you know necessarily damage and we can measure it and uh, lucky enough i think the schematic of this is actually available which would make it a lot simpler and we can try it out and and see if we can figure out what's going on with it all right here is inside of the unit and we find everything that we expect to find uh, except that there is another power supply in this and that makes sense the original power supply, which is the one that I repaired for the old frequency counter, is probably not strong enough and doesn't have the correct voltage to supply rubidium standard as well as everything else. And instead of changing the design of this power supply, they just have a standard one and a standard PCB and the mechanicals all done for that. But they add a separate power supply. It's a 24-volt power supply. and can give 2.5 amps, and that would then power 
only the rubidium standard which is sitting over here and we will take a look at that and if you look at the power cable directly coming from here it only goes to this these two cables that you see coming from the rubidium is a 10 megahertz output and it goes right where the uh, ocxo would normally go if you remember when i repaired the old phillips one uh, the fluke one uh, that one when i in installed the oven control crystal arthritis, I put it right here. And then the original one that was there is just absolutely horrible. And there are a lot of Philips branded ICs here, not to be, uh, again, it's expected because this is a Philips technology and it's a uh, fluke bought them, I believe. And uh, yeah, so and then everything else is pretty straightforward. This one has the added channel C and we will take a look at that uh, for sure because I didn't have one in the old one. So I want to take the can off and see what technology it uses. Likely it's a divider based one like the one that I showed for the Azure before. Other than that, it has a very straightforward design. I think I've talked about this before, so I won't dwell on it uh, too much. But uh, yeah, let's go and take a look. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the two power supplies so we can see which one is the one making noise. Uh, it could be either one and then we can go from there. Maybe it's both of them. And then we'll go and figure out what to do next. I'm quite eager and it's most likely this one because this is the one that's trying to deliver current when we power it on, but it would be a good test. So let me plug this in and make sure my cat doesn't walk on it when it's plugged in and we'll take a look. And here we go, unplugged. And I'm just gonna make sure it doesn't touch anything else because it is going to be live when I enable the power. There we go. And uh, let me just hold it like this. And uh, let's go ahead and turn it on. Oh, no, it still makes that terrible, terrible noise. But I just noticed something interesting. Uh, the fan isn't on. And this fan is powered from this board. Let me go ahead and turn this on, see if the fan comes on. Yep, the fan does come on. So indeed it's working, interesting. Uh, it's kind of weird that this fan doesn't turn on, even though this power supply is always on, even when this is not powered. So I guess this is supposed to cool the whole thing, but doesn't seem to have a very good thermal profile as a result of that little bit unusual design from that point of view. So yeah, this is still making noise. So let me go ahead and turn this off. And I want to try and see it. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but it's kind of <laughs> winding down now. We can go ahead and, and open it a little bit more and take a closer look and see what we find. So when I took the cover off and did some measurements and in verified that the rectifier is working. Now, if you want to get more information about this particular power supply, watch my other video where I do a full repair on this. So I don't want to waste too much of your time. So I went ahead and I took this out again, just like last time. So we can take a look at it. And I suspect that uh, this capacitor might be bad. And this is uh, one of the very first things I'm going to change and see if the behavior of it changes. I'm also going to change the other capacitors because in these are pretty old. And then we can try it. Now, as you know, uh, because the rectifier and the filter capacitor are on this board, the output of, uh, of this over here is DC. And uh, this is just a DC DC converter. Uh, so this just has to accept the rectified DC voltage and it gives you a couple of uh, DC voltages at the output and there are some of them are just diode rectified and on the five volt is uh, fully voltage regulated. So we can go ahead and try that separately. So we don't need this main unit anymore because this is, I just want to make sure this runs quietly and it runs smoothly so that it's reliable. And then we can turn our attention to some of the other components that are there. That's why I don't want to spend too much time on it. So let me show you how I plan to test this on its own. And here is our module. And in order to test this, as I said, because it needs a DC voltage, I made this. Now, I definitely do not recommend that you make this. This is a, an incredibly dangerous uh, thing because of the exposed wires, because of the fact that it can hold such a, sh a large amount of charge and it will rectify it. It's just something I put together. The reason I'm using it again, I'm familiar with high voltages and I'm careful around them and I am using an isolation transformer and I can bring it up slowly so I can have a multiple layers of protection here, uh, but be very careful, don't necessarily do this. In my other video, I use the unit itself to power this and um, you know, th this time I'm just doing something different. But just be, please be very, very careful if you're going to attempt anything like this. So. Before I even turn it on, I'm just going to go and change the capacitors again. Just want to quickly get this. No matter what, I want to change those capacitors anyway. Let's go ahead and change these and see if the noise changes. And then if it works, we can put it back in the unit and, and turn our attention to something else. Well, here are the components I took out. So we can quickly give them a test and see what happens. Uh, for instance, let's start with this largest capacitor here. So I can go ahead and try and measure the ESR of this particular one. And uh, 0.19 ohm uh, ESR is not that great, but it's also not terrible. And the capacitance is, there you go, 1,000, 10,000 microfarad, which is correct. This is what's supposed to be. So this is not a terrible capacitor. Uh, it does have, it is a bit leaky though. Let's try this one. 
and this particular one, what do we see here? Analyzing open circuit or low capacitance. So this is a bad capacitance. I can try it uh, one more time. And what does it say? Yep, open circuit. Doesn't like it at all. Can't even detect that it is it is there. Here's another one. Just the other capacitor there. And analyzing. Oh, yes, I want a 40 ohms. That one is definitely dead. And the last one here, what do we get with this one? Do a quick measurement on it. And uh, nope, doesn't even get detected. So this is an open. And uh, this explains a bit of the behavior because this is the capacitor that's sitting on the PWM IC. So this would be bad uh, if it is open. That's a quite, a, quite a problem. So I have uh, replacement capacitors right here. We can go ahead and put those in. These are all good. These are good Japanese capacitors and they should last a long time. Unfortunately, they are 85 degrees Celsius rated, but eh, I don't really care that much. So we should be able to uh, get this thing going. So I'm eager to try it. Let's put it on, see what happens. All right, here we go. I did all the replacements. I didn't replace that big capacitor because I don't have a 10,000 microfarad version. Uh, it's good enough for now. So we can go ahead and turn it on and see if we get it. anything from the output. And I have it connected directly to the 5 volt output. And let's turn this on, and here we go. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but it's completely silent. And the output voltage can be read over there. It's 5.4 volt DC. There is an adjustment pot there. I'm not going to adjust it yet. I'm going to adjust it when it's in circuit so we can see the exact load that's on it. So this certainly seems to have uh, solved the problem of this power supply. Now we can take it a step further, put it back, power it on, and start investigating other issues with it. All right, all good and ready to test. I did actually end up finding a capacitor. Now I plugged it in, I turned it on, and it is very, very silent. So it's making no noise, and uh, we just have to turn it on and to see what happens on the front panel. I'm just going to clean up and get to that. All right, let's give it a try now. So it sounds pretty good. And here we go. And there it is. Now it says no signal, which is what it should say. It doesn't do that gibberish thing. And what, what more is that I now have the unlock sign of the rubidium turned off. So it looks like the rubidium may also be warmed up and actually functional. So we should be able to put a signal in it and see what we get as just a default a situation and see what without any calibration if we're getting our 10 megahertz and whether this even works. And then I want to take apart and take a quick look at the RF input and then test that as well. And then we should be done. Okay, let's give it a try. So I'm going to use this AT&T rubidium standard uh, that you can buy from eBay. They're not that expensive, actually. And then we're going to hook it up across and see what we get. So let's set this guy to 50 ohm input. And there you go, on channel A. And uh, connect this over here. And connect this to the 10 megahertz output. And let's see what happens. And oh my god, <laughs> that's... That's crazy. Look at that. That's, uh, that's as good as it's going to get. So this rubidium standard compared to the rubidium standard that's in here are basically a perfect match. And this is to be expected, obviously, because these are both atomic references. So we have one, two, three. One, two, three. So these are in the millihertz. So this is a millihertz at the end of that. So pretty, pretty close to each other. I'm not even sure if I'm going to try adjusting it. I'm just curious what would happen if we try and adjust it. And uh, to, be, to be honest, I don't even know which of these two would be out. So it's <laughs> difficult to say. But I will wiggle the frequency adjust a little bit just to see if it will do anything out of curiosity. So I went ahead and I changed the integration time on the Fluke. And now we see a slight difference between the two of them. Uh, so we can go ahead and, and try and change it. And let me go ahead and change this a little bit. If we can get some difference. Let's turn it a quarter of a turn. And I think I'm going in the wrong direction. I think I am. So let's give it a full turn and a half. Now we're at nine. Oh, there we go. Nine, nine. Very, very close now. Nine, eight. I think I can make it a little bit more. Another quarter of a turn. There we go. Ten. Ten megahertz. It's really, really close now. I'm going to make it a little bit tiny more. And that should be good enough. Now, interesting, this last digit. I don't see it changing at all. It always seems to be 6. I'm not sure if that's because my integration time is not long enough, but either way, I mean, I'm pretty happy with this. It's going to be good enough. I mean, I don't do this. I, I'm not a calibration house, so it doesn't matter. But this is a good sign. I mean, they're very, very close to each other to begin with. So now we have a perfect 10 megahertz uh, rubidium-driven 
frequency counter. That's a calibrator also. This is a full, full calibrator that now you can use. You don't even need to have this with you. And here is the module, the 4.5 gigahertz uh, front end. So I can take the cage off of this. And uh, what we see <laughs> is unfortunately a single hybrid module and we cannot really see what's inside of it. But we can make some judgment of what's going on. So the input comes over here. You can see some matching and some uh, network over here, some filters over there. And then we're AC coupled to some clamping diodes. And then we go into this module. Now this is going to have amplifiers, prescaler, even maybe an automatic gain control. And of course the divider, which is a prescaler. And the divider signal then comes out and goes into this. And I couldn't find a part number for this. This is a CA. 3199E, but it looks like it itself is a prescaler, perhaps a lower frequency one to give you the last maybe a factor of four divisions or something. And these two are just voltage regulators. So it's really straightforward. The architecture of it is very similar to the one that I showed before for my Keysight Agilent unit, but uh, except that this that one uses discrete dividers and amplifiers and this one doesn't. It seems to all be one hybrid block probably made by uh, F uh, Philips. And that's really it. That's all there is to it. And unfortunately, this is one of those situations where if this guy breaks, you're going to basically be stuck having to redesign this entirely because there's no way you're going to find this. And anyway, it doesn't have even have any numbers on it. So it'd be very hard to find this proprietary component. But either way, if you have some information on it, you can share with me. But I wanted to show you what's inside of it so that we can go and hook it up to my synthesizer and to see if it's actually working. All right, let's go ahead and measure the Tektronix TSG 4106A. Now the reason I'm choosing that particular unit for measuring is because if you remember when I did a review and teardown of it, it has a very good oven controlled crystal oscillator for very precise reference uh, built into it. This is based on Stanford Research Laboratory's uh, system there. So it looks uh, pretty good and right now I have a set to 250 megahertz with 0 dBm and we can go ahead and see what the instrument says and check it out. We are getting a measurement of 250, and this is kilohertz. So we are very, very close in the, in the hertz range to the rubidium standard, which is pretty reasonable. And as you can see, it doesn't tell me the reference value coming in, the, uh, the power coming in, because it doesn't have a detector, so it doesn't know. It can only give me the power value coming from here. And I'm doing a two-second gating. So 250 megahertz works reasonably well. And uh, let's go ahead and try one gigahertz. So let me just uh, go to the frequency here and enter one gigahertz. There it is. And it's going to settle down again. There it is, one gigahertz, lots and lots of zeros. And uh, that's pretty good. I am pretty happy with that. And oh, I get it. OK, never mind. OK, I was wrong before. This, this number is not the last digit. This is 10 to the something. That's a bit confusing. So it's um, 1 times 10 to the 9 hertz. That's why before that 6 was there, it was you know, 10 times 10 to the 6 megahertz. So anyway, that uh, my apologies for that. This is uh, that for that reason. So there we go. So 1 gigahertz, not too bad. And uh, we can go ahead to, to all the way to this upper range, 4.5 gigahertz. And it should work, hopefully. Let's see. And yep, 4.5 gigahertz, not a problem. Very stable and uh, nice and clean. And it should probably go above the rated value. We can try. 5 gigahertz. Let's see if you can pick that up. Or if we're getting, yeah, it's going to pick it up, no problem. And the question is, how small can I make uh, the amplitude? And let me see if it even works up to 4.5 here. Or I should say 5.5. Uh, yeah, it's beginning to not be able to trigger correctly. So it seems to work perfectly fine at 5 gigahertz. So let me go and change the amplitude to, let's say, minus 6. Can it still detect 5 gigahertz at minus 6 dBm? Yeah, it has no issues. Minus 12 dBm. And yeah, it's going to start having problems there. So, But it works really well, I have to say. So with uh, for its rated output and even above the rated output, I have no problem being able to measure. So I'm curious if I'm at 4.5 gigahertz, which is exactly where it's supposed to be, what is the smallest amplitude I can detect reliably? So here's 4.5 gigahertz in the upper range of its specification. Let's go to minus 10. It's minus 10 dBm. It has no problem at minus 10 dBm. Minus 15 dBm. And minus 15 dBm. It's still happy with that. Minus 20. 
and yeah, even minus 20 dBm, it, it works really well. So uh, it, it looks like within its own specification, uh, it's quite stable. So here's minus 25 dBm, and yeah, it's now beginning to break in about minus 20 to minus 25 dBm is a typical range for no external amplifier counters to be able to detect reliably. So it looks like minus 20 dBm is still not an issue and he can pick it up perfectly fine at the upper range of his frequency. So, and it's very good, and you can see it's very accurate. Again, we have quite a few digits there that match perfectly, and this is a very good synthesizer for its absolute frequency accuracy. So I'm not surprised that we're getting a good value out of it. So really happy with that. Now I'm curious on going around the lab and measuring everything, uh, because it is a calibrator, so we could actually go around and calibrate a whole lot of different things. And uh, out of curiosity, I'm going to just measure one other little thing on well, one of my Agilent synthesizers, one of the old ones, uh, and see how good those are. So let's quickly try the Agilent 33250A, which is an arbitrary array from generator. I'm just curious on, on how well it behaves. So let's set it to 10 megahertz here, and the amplitude, set it to 1 volt peak to peak. And that should be good enough for our purposes. And uh, right now it's probably set to a high impedance output, but it doesn't matter. So let's go ahead and see what we get when I enable it. And output, here we go. Let's see, and let's settle down for a second. You know what? Oh no, never mind. I was going to say it's pretty good, but I didn't notice there's actually five here. So you can see how different uh, this is from another rubidium standard, or even from what I was measuring, the Tektronix TSG 4106. That's the difference between having a really stable oven controlled crystal oscillator sitting in the, in your instrument and what a difference it makes in terms of your frequency accuracy. So yeah, I'm quite happy with that and um, we can go ahead and measure a whole bunch of things around the lab, but this is a really nice unit. I'm quite impressed with it and it's going to be great for calibrating and keeping everything uh, on the right time base and this includes oscilloscopes and spectrum analyzers. So yeah, quite nice. I, mean, I hope you like this video. It's going to be a short one, none of the ones that are, it's not going to be one of the ones that gets charged to Patreon, of course, because it's a quick one, but I am working on a tutorial, hopefully I'll finish it today, and that one's pretty exciting, so hopefully you will like that. I'll see you soon in the comment section.